Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank God for a new day that he has given to us. And we thank him for allowing us to come once again to this program that the entrance of your words gives light. The entrance of your words gives light. This is a teaching program. We seek to teach the word of God in a way that we can apply it to our lives. And we have been dealing with a topic for the past weeks. Today we are going to continue. You get this program from Facebook and also from Rex Van Radio. And Rex Van Radio has an app you can download on your phones and on your devices and you should be able to listen to this program and other Christian programs as well. Then later you will have it on YouTube. These are different channels by which you can get this program. My name is Emmanuel Ousu, and today we are going to continue the topic, the names of God, the names of God. And this is part 19, part 19. Shall we pray? Once again, Father, we come before you this morning. We open up our hearts with gratitude. We appreciate the things you have done for us, even for the past week having brought us thus far we lift up ourselves unto you even as we come before you and we pray that you will speak to us in your own way and you will teach us from your word in the name of jesus amen okay once again i welcome your soul spirit and body to this program and as i have already announced we are continuing our topic the names of God. The names of God. This is part 19. We have been dealing with the name of God called Jehovah Ra or Jehovah Rohi. And this name means the Lord my shepherd. And we also said that you can say the Lord shepherds me. And the main text that we have been using is from Psalm 23, which is a very popular psalm, a psalm of comfort, a psalm of hope, a psalm that brings strength, a psalm that many people go to, especially in times of challenge and difficulties. And we are looking at this psalm in relation to God being our shepherd. We have come <coughs> a long way. But today we are hoping to run it up for this name. So I want you to go along with me. For the sake of our study, we want to go back to our main text that we have been using. The scriptures that we have been using for this whole study on the names of God. And I want to read them quickly from here. One from Psalm 8 verse 1. Psalm 8 verse 1. From the New King James Version. The O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth who have set your glory above the heavens. And then I read from Psalm 9 verse 10. And those who know your name will put their trust in you for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. You want to take note of these two scriptures that we always highlight. The first one talks about the name of the Lord being excellent. Excellent means don't look for any other one. It is enough. It is the perfect one. The second one also tells us that those who know that excellent name will put their trust in him. In other words, if that excellent name is there, you can only say that you didn't know. But if only you know, you are going to put your trust in him. Because he will not forsake those who put their trust in him. And that is why we have sought to understand the names of God. Of course, we cannot deal with all the names. But as we go along, 
you number one want to know that this name is excellent and number two when you get to know this name then you want to put your trust in him we want to continue i am going to read our main passage for today again and it is coming from psalm 23 the new king james version last week we dealt with verse 1 to 3 and today we are going to continue from the verse 4 to the end we hope to run up on that so i'm reading from new king james version psalm 23 the lord is my shepherd i shall not want he makes me to lie down in green pastures he leads me beside the still waters he restores my soul he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake yet though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i will fear no evil for you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies you anoint my head with oil my cup runs over surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and i will dwell in the house of the lord for ever amen okay once again we come to this passage and i'm praying that the spirit of god will minister unto your heart even as we go through the rest of this passage the lord my shepherd the lord my shepherd father in the name of jesus once again i pray if there are any listening to me at this time and they are disturbed they are worried i pray that you will touch their hearts as the shepherd of their soul i give you praise in the name of jesus amen i don't know what you may be going through but this morning i'm presenting again to you that the lord is your shepherd maybe you've been wandering around like a sheep that has gone astray but i'm bringing you back home to wire you to this message that the lord is your shepherd i will jump to the verse 4 shortly but a quick recap last week we established that the sheep by default needs a shepherd and we also talked about the characteristics of the shepherd that he is a good shepherd then we came to verse 1 where we highlighted that David was personalizing this that he's not thinking about any other person of course other people can use it but he said the Lord is my shepherd. He's not speaking in the plural. He's, he's sing, speaking in the singular. He is my shepherd. And then he said because of that he's not going to want. He continues to say that he leads me. So now he makes me to lie down. He, he, it is the Lord who is doing this. Now I'm not going to go to all the verses. But when you start with the verse 1. You see the picture after personalizing it like the Lord is my shepherd. That is the declaration he is making there. You see that he continues to say it like he, he, he. So it's like he is talking about the Lord to us or whoever is listening. But there is a sharp shift when you get to the verse 4. And today we are going to continue from the verse 4. So you understand what I'm trying to point out here. And remember, I said that I'll be highlighting on some few things as I go along. So you want to also take note of that. Now, in coming back to David, he is a shepherd, so he knows what he was doing. But now, we are seeing, um, let me explain this. We have praise, 
and we have worshipped him. There is a difference between the two, even though they can blend and they can mix up. What that means is that you can be praising God and you end up in worship, or you can be worshiping God, you end up in praise, whichever way. But the difference between praise and worship, basically, is that for praise, you're talking about the thing that God does or he will do, or he has done. But for worship, you address God who he is. In fact, you give worship to God because he is worthy. Okay, why am I bringing this one in here? You see, when David is talking now, in trying to talk about God, he started as a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm just trying to interject here. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me. So he brings he. The he is pointing something like David is talking to the shepherd. He's talking about the shepherd to us. He, whoever is listening, he's painting a picture about his shepherd to them. So that sort of bothers on the line of praise, trying to let people know who God is. Then you come to the verse 4. I want to read that one again. Yet though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff they comfort me. So you see, over here, we have this God who is the shepherd, and David is talking about him. Then he quickly shifts. When he's talking about walking through the valley of the shadow of death, he sort of personal, brings it home in a way that he's rather talking about his God. In a, okay, let me put it this way. It's like I met David. He's talking to me about his shepherd. You are my shepherd. He's my shepherd. He's been doing this. He's been doing that. And then all of a sudden, we see the conversation changes. And it is like, you. So it's like now, he's talking to the God who is his shepherd. So I am standing there listening to him. But then he turns his attention to the shepherd himself. I find that to be so beautiful. I don't know the best way to explain this for you to understand. But you want to sit for a moment and connect what I'm trying to bring up here. That the man understands this shepherd to be taking a very good care of him. To the tune that even whilst he's narrating the story, he cannot hold back. He cannot help it. But to just come back and address the one who has been shepherding him. I pray God will give you understanding into this. I'm talking about something deep here. He is talking about God. But he said that you, you, he brings that part in. It's remarkable. Let's continue. Okay, so now, after David is talking about his shepherd, he comes to talk about the valley of shadow of death. Listen carefully. He said that the valley of the shadow of death. So that means... He is talking about something related to death, but not death itself. I want you to pay attention here. He talks about death, but it's a shadow of death. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So it is not the death itself, but then the shadow of it. In fact, the Bible said that when Jesus came, he got to redeem those who for the fear of death, for all their life, they were like in slavery to sin. In other words, it is not the death per se, but the fear of the death. So here, it is not the death per se, but it is the shadow of death. I want to put it in another way. You can go to the hospital and the doctor will tell you that, oh, this disease and that disease that you have, um, if you are not careful, uh, you can die. So you are not dead yet, but you live in fear of that death. The death has not come. And those things can be much more disturbing. The shadow. The shadow is, if there is a shadow about something, it is not a 
real thing. It is uh, something pointing to the real thing. But here, David is saying that he's walking through the shadow of death. In other words, he's so gripped with circumstances and situations that are spelling out death, that are dictating death, that are speaking for death, that are commanding death, that are sort of bringing him so close to the point that you are no more. And those things, if you are not careful, they can cripple you for life. Now, let's look quickly at the background of what the psalmist is actually bringing out to us. For the fear of God, for the fear of the shadow of death, David brings out something that I will fear no evil. And he gives a reason why he will fear no evil. He says, for thou art with me. Thou art with me. And I love that. So over here, he's talking about the very presence of God being with him. You remember last time he talked about the omniscience of God, which means that God sees everywhere and he knows everywhere. He knows everything. But he said that it's one thing knowing everything. I can be watching a soccer, a soccer match on the TV, and I'm seeing the field, I see the players, I see everything. But there is no way I can kick the ball, you see? But if somebody by chance happened to be at the stadium, maybe they are on the touch lines or somewhere, and the, the, the ball gets out of the field, they can take it and pick, uh, kick it for them. What I'm trying to say, that is real life there. They can be involved when they are there. So presence is different from knowing. So when you talk about the omnipresent God, that adds value to who our shepherd is to us. So David is saying that, well, it seems like God knows everything, but I have more. No wonder at that point, he turns it from the hill to the you. That, yet yeah, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. This morning, I don't know what you are going through, but I'm here to announce to you that the Lord is with you. In fact, that is the name when Jesus came to the earth, he took the name Emmanuel, God with us. So it is no more God being distant from us, but he is with us. Coming back to the background, the, the people, the shepherds of those times, sometimes they will have to move, especially around summertime, they will have to be moving their, their flock from place to place. And sometimes in moving them, maybe they will move them from a low land to a high land. And when they are moving, sometimes they will have to pass through the valley. And the valley is a symbol of the low point. So you can say the low point in your life. I've told you that it is a shadow of death. The valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes you get to the low point of your life said that you think nothing else matters again. In fact, some people get to the point where they even reject help from people because they think enough is enough. I am done. I can't continue any longer. There is no more hope for me. After all, nobody cares. You get to that low level and of course, sometimes people can make mockery of you. They can they can do all sorts of things. But then, that is part of life. David experienced this. And he was saying that I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So for those who were passing through, the shepherd who was passing his sheep through the valley, it is possible that there are dangers. Some of them could be predators. Sometimes it could be storms. And then sometimes there could even be rocks maybe falling off from mountains, and that there may be a lot of other disasters. You are in the valley. You are down there. Anything can fall on you. Any animal can take you as a prey. It is a dangerous place to be walking around. 
yourself in. Let's say you went to the hospital. The doctor said that this disease, this is the disease we have found. But I'm sorry to announce to you that for this disease, there is no cure. You see, when he said there is no cure, even if the, there is a cure or there is a medicine for it, and the medicine will not help. When they tell me there is a medicine, it brings some consolation. But when the doctor says that there is no cure, that is enough to kill you because it's like that and that. So I'm trying to paint the picture here. The circumstance, when they mention there is no cure, brings fear to you. As against when the doctor says that, oh, for this one, we can treat it. You see that it expels fear. So now in the valley, by virtue of it being a valley, you can be in a marriage and then you see that this marriage is on the rocks. And by all standards, it tells you that the marriage is going to collapse. You begin to think about so many things and it brings fear. You can be going to the school and then you see that these lecturers are rough. Rough means that they are not very friendly. They, will, they are there and their intent is to fail you. As soon as you get to know it, you know that your life maybe at the college or at the school is going to be miserable. It brings some fear. In the valley, there is fear. This morning, I don't know. What you are going through, it can be an immigration issue, it can be financial issues, it can be medical, it can be academic, it can be marital, it can be about your family, it could be anything. But maybe you have come so low to a point that you know that this one, there is a shadow around, a shadow of death, walking through the valley of death. Valley of death. But David points out boldly here that I will fear no evil. I will fear no evil. And he brings to our attention the reason why he is not fearing evil because he said that you are with me. I am stressing on this point for us today. In case you don't get anything home, just take this home. That no matter the low point that you get to in life, in fact, there are times people will be telling you about your low point. Oh, this thing that happened to you, I think, oh, that thing that is coming to you, I think they may bring their opinion, but they are not God. You want to know that you can walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Look at this combination. It is a valley. It is also a shadow of death. I have told you, these are enough to induce fear in you. It is not a sin to be afraid. Maybe as a Christian, sometimes some people present themselves so, uh, what should I say, righteous and holy and something spiritual. That is the way. They present themselves so spiritual that sometimes they think it's a failure or it's a defeat when certain things are coming their way. You can be a very good Christian. You go to school, you write exams and fail. There's nothing unspiritual about it. After all, even the lecturer who is teaching you, do you know what he has gone through? What I'm trying to say is that there are certain things that are relatives in life. You might be so low. You might be so low. But then, the point here is that in that situation, David pointing out that good shepherd tells us that you are with me. And because of that, I am not going to be afraid. You may be walking through distress, pain. It could be sorrow. It could be rejection. It could be some death of a sort. It could be sickness. It could even be loneliness. It could be joblessness. It could be marital and familiar issues. I've mentioned these things. You want to know that the Lord is with you. You can explain to people, they may not understand. Or you may explain to people and they may not see the seriousness of it because you are going through it. It is the valley. And I've told you, just the fact that you are in the valley brings that fear. You want to tell yourself that I will fear no evil. As I speak, I want to kick out fear from your life to let you know, injecting into your spirit, that there is a shepherd right by you. And because of that shepherd, nothing evil can befall you. He said, I will fear no evil. Not some of the evils, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. A story is told, I remember it's, it's, a, it's even painted, there is this wall hanging, 
And you have seen a man walking with, of course, the man, the name of the, uh, the, paint, the painting shows Jesus, and then walking with another person. They were walking together, and you see that there were two steps. Two steps mean that there are four steps. One st full step here, one full step there. They were walking together, and then it got to a time that the full step became only one. That is only one footprint for one person. So later, the other person, supposedly a Christian, was asking the Lord. I said this is a, a, a war hang in the picture, trying to paint, a, a, a tell a story in the picture. So the person walking with the Lord Jesus was asking, why is it that there was a time that we were walking together and then we had these two uh, footprints, normally mine and yours. And then later, I saw only one mean that you left me alone. And then I was, so, uh, I was supposed to suffer through the thick, thickness and the darkness of life. Those challenging times, I only saw one footstep. And then the Lord explained to him that in the times that it was more difficult, I carried you on my arms. So the first step that you see is not yours, it was mine because I was carrying you. I can't, I can't see any other way that I can explain this to you for this picture pays it well for us. So you see, when David is saying, you are with me, that means when the challenges become more difficult, your Lord will carry you on his arms. You see, he will not let you alone and he will not leave you alone. He will not let you suffer alone. He is there with you. Why? He is the good shepherd. David is telling us, I will walk through the valley of the shepherd. You look at the world now, you can even say that all of us somehow, some way, are walking in the valley of the shadow of death. There is death spelled around everywhere, but he will fear no evil who has his trust in the name of the Lord, that is the Lord my shepherd. The Lord my shepherd, walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. This morning, once again, I want to speak to your spirit, your soul, and your body, that fear no evil if you have the Lord as your shepherd, because he is with you. And then he continues to say that your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So you see, I've talked so long about the, the fear no evil thing, because that is something like a cancer, and it is eating us. Fear, fear. You go to the workplace, you read from the news, and then it's like, these people are laying off, that people are, and you begin to think, and maybe it's getting a lot of things around us putting fear. But let's put fear to rest, and let's inject some faith in us, knowing that the Lord, who is our shepherd, will carry us through. But David is not done. He said that your rod, your rod, and your staff. Bible scholars have um, different ways that they explain this. We are not worrying ourselves with what they are saying, but we want to only want to get the, 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 the whole thing, the concept that is involved here. Some people say that the rod and the staff are the same things that they are talking about. Others also saying that the rod is a different thing and the staff is a different thing. So whichever way, we are mentioning two things here, rod and staff. Let's say a shepherd can have his rod, which he's still using as a staff, or a staff he's using as a rod, or he can have a staff there, and he can have a rod there. Whichever way it is, there is a rod and there is a staff. And then we said that your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So the first part that I'm dealing with here, is the part that is saying that I am walking to the valley of the shadow of death. And the second part here is when he's talking about us. So the valley of the shadow of death is like when there is no fear. And then he's saying that rod and staff, they comfort me. So not only are you going to be protected, says that you will fear no evil, but also you are going to be comforted in the situation when you have been rejected by men, when it seems like nobody even wants to come close again to you, the Lord is with you and he is going to comfort you. He is going to make you feel good. Well, maybe your situation is said that you might be doubting what we are saying that how can it be and how is that possible? Because you think that you have been suffering 
for far too long. Well, do you know that somebody may not eat for a day and either they become sick or they could even end in some crisis, but you have not eaten for two days and you are still alive and maybe stronger and you have been thinking that, oh, so not eating can help my, my body like this, then nowadays I will even not eat sometimes. I'm, I'm painting a picture here that you didn't, I'm not talking about you fasting. You didn't have food. So you didn't eat. Sometimes the ratio will be one, one, zero. One means you got breakfast, you got lunch, and then dinner, you skipped. Or zero, zero, one. Sometimes when the zero gets to the end of it, it's more dangerous because um, there is something they call, <laughs> what do they call it? Small, small, right? In the night, uh, you are, you are, my, my, my children will say, my tummy was rumbling. So it's like you sleep in the night, you turn to the left, you turn to the right. You see that the sleep doesn't want to come because of certain things that are going on. What I'm trying to say that you are hungry in the night. So if you sleep on an empty stomach, it's a challenge. But the point here is that when you were even going through that, you were so strong and composed. But somebody not so well. So the point is, in the midst of that, because the Lord was with you, you are still able to endure. Somebody may lose a loved one and they may never get back on their feet again. The rest of their life, in fact, some of them, it can drive them also to their grave earlier. But you have lost a loved ones, a loved one, and now you are on your feet. You are more cheerful even than the people around you. You see, there is somebody, the shepherd, who is comforting you. I'm making a point here that regardless of the situation, sometimes we think of the, it, it like uh, left or right turn. Like if we say the Lord is my shepherd, then I shouldn't have trouble. No. The troubles will come. You remember the last time we mentioned that no weapon formed against you. That means the weapon will be formed. So you can go through the challenges, but he is there to comfort you. Comfort. It is the comfort. Okay, let's say you are lying on a bed and say this bed is very comfortable. That means you feel so relaxed. In other words, when we're talking about comfort, in the midst of the difficulty, in the midst of the challenges, you still feel like, well, that is not the worst part of life. And you are still up and doing. He comforts your rod and your staff. They comfort me. So now, let's look quickly at the rod. For the rod, it brings protection. And it is a symbol of authority, strength, power, and defense. So now, David is talking about the valley issue. He's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And he tells us that his shepherd has a rod. And we are saying here that that rod is a symbol of authority. It is a symbol of strength. It is a symbol of power. And also it is a symbol of defense. In other words, the rod, if an animal comes around, the shepherd can use the rod to chase it off. Okay, so having this, should I call it equipment there, or a weapon, that rod in itself grants security. You know that there is a defense coming from this rod. And it talks about the staff. The staff also helps the sheep when it is in trouble. If you have seen the picture before, you see that the rod seems more like a straight uh, something. And then the staff seems more like a scab at the top. So the staff is able to bring the sheep. When it is going astray, you can just, <coughs> I don't know if you see my hand well. You can just use it to turn it around. You can just hook it up <laughs> and then turn it back to yourself. So David is talking about two things here. One is that the rod is able, that with the power and authority, it is able to defend, protect. But the, the staff is also able to bring him closer when he even goes wayward, when he goes astray, when he misses his direction. It is this same rod, the, this staff, that brings him back to himself. So he's talking about two things here. The Lord is defending him, said that he will not fall prey to enemies, but at the same time, the Lord is defending him, said that he will not go astray to fall as a prey to the enemy. 
your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And this also talks about discipline if you are a child of God. You see, the Bible says that the one that is loved by the Father is the one who is disciplined. Some people go to church, they don't want discipline. When they go where what? And they are not ready to change. When in the church, they are disciplined, all that they will quickly do is that I have stopped this church. In fact, some of them even go to other churches and they can become pastors and they can recruit other uh, people who are also uh, under discipline to be their pastor. What kind of church are you forming? And what kind of God are you going to deal with? Well, if it is God that you mean, he was in the former church that you left. So how are you going to perform in your new church? Sometimes we need to subject ourselves to the discipline of God. It could be a public discipline in the church, but sometimes individually, personally, the Lord might pass you through certain disciplines and you need to abide by them because there is a staff component when you have the shepherd that sometimes he needs to discipline you. If you have seen a shepherd before, Sometimes you just hit the, the, the sheep if it is misbehaving. Okay, so now let's move on to the verse 5. So we've talked about the valley of the shadow of death. The Lord is with me. He says, you. So he brings the you path. And he says that I will fear no evil. And also you have the rod, you have the staff that comforts me. Verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of of my enemies you anoint my head with oil my cup runs over you the you is coming again so you see there is a much more intimacy here you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy a background to this part is that for the shepherd sometimes it takes some extra strength to get, remember when we were starting, we said that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. That green pastures, it takes effort on the part of the shepherd to search for the green pastures. You don't just walk around and you see, of course, if you're a shepherd, remember that there are other shepherds also. So the shepherd needs to carefully prepare that uh, pasture, get the pasture for the sheep. And a background here is pointing to the fact that sometimes there may be places that the sheep can graze, but then you can see that there are also other weeds that may be toxic. They may not be, they, they may be harmful to the sheep. It is the duty of the shepherd to prevent the sheep from grazing on those types of leaves. Sometimes they may have to remove, remove them or whichever way. In other words, preparing the grounds such that they can eat and eat safe. So, painting this picture, you look at it like the bad weed will be something like somebody or an enemy. Something that is not for your progress, but for your fall. If the sheep should feast on them, they will get sick or they may die. But he said that you prepare a table before me. So they can get to a higher ground, maybe on a top somewhere. The sheep can be grazing. Or the, the wheat may not be good. But then the shepherd has done a careful work, said that they may not fall in the hands of the enemy. So in the presence, in an area where there can be danger, the shepherd has made provision in such a way that the sheep are saved from that danger in the presence of enemies. This is the, the background that we are painting. So in the same way, you see, Jesus was praying in, in John chapter 17. And he was mentioning that the Lord should protect us. And he said, I'm not saying take them out of the world. They are in the world, but they are not of the world. So a picture, a similar picture is here. We are not taken out of the world. So the enemies that are fighting against us, they are here around us. By the way, when I say enemies, I'm not talking about your brother or your sister who is sitting by you. Well, the devil can use them to do something bad against you, but they are not the target. The devil is the target. So you want to be mindful of that. In the midst of these enemies around us, 
The Lord is not taking us away. Remember, even in the valley of the shadow of death, there was no fear of evil because the Lord was with him. That is what David is telling us. So in the midst of enemies, we should not be afraid, trying to run away, thinking that the enemy may get us. No, we have somebody more powerful, the shepherd, who is on our side. So in the midst of the enemies, David said that you even prepare a table before me. You have prepared this table, said that my enemies will see that I'm feasting, regardless of what they are plotting or planting against me. Well, maybe you are so obsessed with enemies around, with things that are projected against you to bring your downfall. In fact, it's so unfortunate that now Christians seem to be talking more about the enemy than God. It's, it's unfortunate. And you say, what are you saying? Go to the churches. See people praying. The larger percentage of their prayer is about the enemy. Satan, devil, whatever. They are dealing with the Satan. I'm not saying don't pray against Satan. Fine. But the point is, with that content, how much of it was about God? You see, David is bragging, busting, talking about the shepherd. He said, he, 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 he even shit to you. He is concentrating on the one who is his shepherd and not on the one who is the enemy and on entity. He doesn't have to waste so much time. Christians of today. No wonder we are chasing prophets here and there. We want to, somebody to tell us something. And because of that, we are being deceived. But here, we see that the emphasis is on the one who is preparing the table for us in the presence of our enemies, meaning that enemies are around, we don't care. Because the one who is preparing the table is able to secure our life. You see, when David is talking about the Lord being his shepherd, he knows what he's talking about. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So even in the presence of my enemies, I am eating. In fact, when he says prepare a table, that means it's not just the ordinary food. Something much more delicious, much more palatable, something good. And enemies will see, and yet they cannot harm you. I'm here to let you know that while you may be facing challenges in your life, you may say that, as for you, you don't know my family, you don't know what I'm going to do. I know that there could be challenges. There could be plots against you. There could be evil intentions against you. But the point I'm making is that you don't need to worry yourself so much about them. You rather want to worry yourself about the Lord who is your shepherd. Because in the midst of enemies, he will set a table before you. Okay, let's go on. My, you anoint my head with oil. You anoint my head with oil. This anointing and is coming with oil. Number one, remember it is a shepherd picture we are painting. The anointing will come when he, he puts it on the head of the sheep. So let's paint the picture of the sheep, but then we also know that he is anointing us. But for the sheep, when the shepherd puts the oil on their head, it's not just the hair. Remember, <laughs> uh, the, the sheep, there is hair all over the body anyway. So he's talking about the head here. You are anointing my head with oil. In the midst of the challenges, we remember that we, we said, when he said, you, he, he makes me to lie down. We said that there are about four conditions that are to be satisfied before the sheep can lie down. And one of them was about flies, pa uh, parasite. So the flies would disturb the, the sheep, said that it cannot have that peace of mind to lie down. When they are anointing the head, it sort of repels the flies. And when the flies are repelled, then the sheep has that peace of mind and it is able to lie down peacefully. So in painting the picture that you anoint my head with oil, meaning that the things that would disturb me, and of course, 
In talking about the head, you should know that your mind is in the head, right? <laughs> that is if you have the head that everybody has. Your mind is in the head. So there's a lot of things that a devil can project. The mind is the battlefield. The mind is the battlefield. So it is like spirit fighting the flesh. All those battles go on there. When the mind is, um, the head is anointed, it's covered. Now you see that all those flies that could be disturbing the sheep, they are sort of repelled. And they don't have a connection to the head and the mind. And therefore, the sheep has that sound mind. You see, the Bible said that the Lord has not given us the, the spirit of fear. So now, when you have fear in you, it starts from the mind. It gets you confused. You can concentrate on things you are doing. But if your mind is stable, the Bible continues that it is of a sound mind. When you have a sound mind up here, I can promise you that your whole body will be sound. Sound mind. If you are disturbed in your mind, you see that it will go into the heart. When the heart gets it, it, it springs up to the emotions and you begin to act them. So the mind, the center of this battle, he said that he anoints the hair with oil. Oil repels the pest, the flies, and then the sheep will have that soundness. I don't know what is the battle in your mind. I don't know what is disturbing you. Maybe like some parasite, some pest that are disturbing your life. It could be anything. It could be challenges about life. It could be things that people are projecting against you. But the shepherd is able to anoint your head with oil. Another thing also about the oil, I understand, is supposed to, when they are anointed, it, it sort of um, um, takes away that friction. Of course, for, for oil, it is for lubrication. So it, it paints the picture. When there is lubrication, there is no more friction. So the things that will be a struggle, sometimes you go to churches, you see struggles here and even the ship themselves. If you are fighting an enemy, you don't fight among yourself. Otherwise, the enemy will stand there and be looking at you. When you fight and you, you destroy yourself, he has won. So even in fighting among you, when there is oil, the friction is either reduced or eradicated. It's, it's taken away. So among them, there is that sort of cordiality. He annoys me. Remember, that is also one part of the things that will let the sheep lie down. So the parasites are gone, and the friction is also gone. The oil brings some smoothness and some lubrication. And also your own life becomes smoother because there is the oil. You anoint my head with oil. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. I like that portion. So the anointing is bringing abundance here. My cup runs over. If you go to a place, they give you a drink. They pour it in and you see that the drink is overflowing. <laughs> that means you got more than enough. David is painting the picture here that this thing is more than enough. My cup runs over. Let me descend. Verse 6. No, so now we are landing. Verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So, two things that we want to look at here. He is saying that you anoint my head. So, now we see that peaceful atmosphere that has been created for the sheep. And he is able to convince himself. In fact, I, I look at this as progress. We talk about the protection. We talk about the preservation. We talk about so many things. But this one is progress because... The psalmist or David is saying that, you see, this thing that I'm talking about, there is an extended version of it. It is going to continue. And he's 
able to say this with confidence that surely, when he says something is sure, that means you can't miss it. I'm still talking about the Lord being our shepherd. We are looking at Psalm 23. And we come into the very last end of it. David says, so the beginning, he gave us a summary. The end, he is talking about things that are yet to come. He's even projecting that surely goodness and mercy, other versions will say, and love, goodness and mercy shall follow me. And maybe I didn't get that. Let me read it again. Goodness and mercy shall follow me. Yes. Me. He's not talking about you. He's not talking about the other person. He's talking about the me. Me. Remember, he said the Lord is my shepherd. And this is all that my shepherd is doing. And therefore, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me. Now, some of us, we have some grace for one day. And we are not so sure about tomorrow. You went to the workplace and you got promoted. And the problem now is that you are thinking that this promotion they gave to me, is it possible that tomorrow they will take it away from me? No, I'm here to announce to you that if you have the shepherd, like the David type, the God of heaven, be your shepherd. You are rather progressive and not retrogressive. You don't go back, rather you move forward. David said, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me. And here is the catch. He is not even worrying himself to follow them. Now, Christians are chasing miracles. We are chasing, you see, these are supposed to enhance our Christian living. But that is not all the story. <laughs> Let me be blunt here. You see, the salvation is not in about the miracles. There are people who were healed. Remember, there were these 10 people who were healed. Only one went to Jesus. Where are the rest? They went away. They got their healing. They don't need salvation. They're gone. So you can even be healed and not get your salvation. I'm talking about the one who is hooked to the law. That is the key. So David says, so long as I'm hooked, I am very sure of this. I don't care about what you say. I don't care about people who are attacking me and think that I don't deserve this. I don't care about people who are even praying against me. What I know is that because the Lord is my shepherd, I am very sure of this fact. This morning, as I run up, I want to bring this conclusion to you. That in your life, if only, and I said if only, you have God on your side. And he is your shepherd. Wake up every morning telling yourself that surely, yes, because it is sure, it will not fail. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. So if you wake up one day and some things are twisted, convoluted, undulating, like they are not balanced well, sit up and ask yourself, where is the all the days? Because today is also inclusive. All the days of my life. All the days. So every day, that surety is there for goodness and for mercy. Goodness and mercy. They will follow you, meaning that when you are running, they run. When you are crawling, they will not run past you said that you have to change them, they will have to crawl. If you squat, they squat. When you sit, they sit. You stand, they stand. You lie, they lie. When you are eating, they have to be waiting like waitresses. And then they will have to wait on you. What I'm saying that he says, goodness and mercy will follow, will follow. Many are the Christians out there who are chasing goodness and mercy in the name of prosperity and sometimes they go to places they charge them some amount of money that you can get no 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 you don't get it you don't get it david said the lord is my shepherd he takes care of me in other words if you allow the lord to take care of you and you don't want to you are not going ahead of him these are steps these are steps he says goodness and mercy shall follow me 
will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So this is David signing off. Hey friends, hey guys, I came to tell you about the Lord concerning my shepherd. I am done. I am turning off. I am signing off. But listen to this. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In other words, if there is any other place that I can get all this, remember it's taking me about three days to be talking about this. And if I meant I could go more, meaning that the thing that the David is talking about is deep. But just to give us the flavor, he said that if I want this to be sustained, one, the thing is sure. But you know, you can only get this when you are hooked to that shepherd. So he said, the Lord is my shepherd. So he said that end, when we bring end to a sentence, that means you cannot go and you can leave half of it. In other words, it is not like we have done this so we are fine. No. With all that he has said, he said that end, meaning that there's another portion of it. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Remember last time I was talking about the preservation when God is preserving us, he restores my soul. And I said that that preservation part is God preserving us, bringing us back to where we should be. This is another preservation here, but it is from the, 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 the sheep himself. David said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord, meaning that I'm going to keep myself here. I will not shift to be, to be restored. No, I will keep myself here. I will dwell. I will stay, I will abide, I will live in the house of the Lord. For some of us, going to church has become optional now. And you are still claiming, and you are still what? What did they say? Claiming and then abiding, losing, whatever. No, there is a secret. He says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you want the all the days, then and you you also want to commit yourself dwelling in his house forever. Let me quickly say this, and I will sign off. So the goodness is given to you; it is providing for you goodness, the goodness of God. But there is the other component, mercy. I love that one. You see, mercy is equal but opposite to grace. Grace is unmerited favor. You don't deserve it and it is given to you. But mercy is the opposite, being that you deserve some punishment and they say they will not give that to you. You stole something they were supposed to sentence you to 400 years in jail and then they said, that, well, we are forgiving you. So that is mercy. And David is saying that there is goodness. In other words, God providing. And then there is also mercy where people think that you don't qualify for this. And then mercy is pushing behind and said, well, because of me, because of me, I am giving it to you. It's not a matter of you questioning. I am giving it to you. That is mercy. Remember when he said that, and their righteousness is of me. Isaiah 54, verse 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Any tongue that rises against you, in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me. This righteousness by God is saying that, well, you can disqualify him. Yes, I am aware of that. But now I am saying he should get it. He is putting a seal. He is putting a stamp on it. He said goodness and mercy. So as I pain of know that if the Lord is your shepherd, then you know, as you move, he grants grace. He gives you goodness. Whatever that he is giving to you, there is no other person who can say you don't qualify because mercy is also following, shouting out loud that I am giving it to him because I chose to. That is the shepherd I present to you. This morning, maybe you don't have a personal relationship with him. I've said a lot for these past days. You want to make him your shepherd. You want to surrender your life to him. David said, surely, can you say that for yourself? That goodness and mercy will follow you. And he says, I am going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Maybe you want to commit yourself to this and say, I, I want to be like David, that I can have this shepherd, and therefore, I want to be in the house of the Lord. If you want to be in the house of the Lord, then you need to surrender to the Lord of the house so that he will have your life and he will be your shepherd. 
If you want to do that, you want to raise up your two hands and pray this short prayer after me. After that, we pray together. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for today. I admit that I'm a sinner and that you died for me. Therefore, this morning, I accept you as my Lord and personal Savior. I will serve you all the days of my life. Amen. Please put your hands down and then we will pray together as you run off on the Lord, my shepherd. Once again, Father, we come before you thanking you so much for being our shepherd, the great shepherd of our soul. We are so grateful unto you that because you are a shepherd, it is well. We shall not want. Let us understand this and let us totally depend on you. In the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for you are with us. I thank you for the life of those who have seen that vacuum created in their life, and they want to fill it up, making you their shepherd. I pray that you embrace them in your arms, and you show them your way, so that they can also say that you are their shepherd. As I pray, if there are any that are going through any difficulties, challenges, if they have gone downhill, if they have gone through the valleys, they have gone to the lowest point of their life. Because you are our shepherd, I pray that you will bring them out, even like from the Mary clay, and set them on a hill. I give you praise. I give you glory in the name of Jesus. We thank you for another time in your presence. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Beloved, God richly bless you for making the time to come. Once again, I want to encourage you to share this. Next week, God willing, we are going to continue with another name of God. Until then, bye-bye for now, and God bless you for coming on the line. See you.